as well. Um, so we have officially started. Um, so thanks everyone for joining. Um, I'm Angela Daly. I'm the co-director of the Strathclyde Centre for Internet Law and Policy, uh, which is hosting this event. And we're really delighted um, to have one of our colleagues, uh, Stephen Blythe, Stephen McLeod Blythe, rather, um, who is going to give um, the seminar uh, today. Um, Stephen is um, a man of many talents. Um, his day job is uh, for Automatic, uh, the internet company that you may know better for services such as Tumblr and WordPress. Um, but he also is a visiting researcher in our centre, uh, specialising in uh, copyright, e-commerce, um, and I think in particular intermediary uh, liability. And in addition to all of that, he's also a musician and photographer. So someone who's got a very kind of multifaceted uh, approach uh, to copyright from various different uh, perspectives. Um, so I think without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Stephen, um, who will be talking today about um, the legacy and impact of uh, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Yes, uh, I'm going to share my screen. I don't think it ever works first time, so give me a second. Uh, oh, here we go. Let me know if you can see that or not see that. It says you've started screen sharing. Can you see the screen sharing? Oh, great. Brilliant. Um, work for a huge internet company and can't even work the internet. Uh, what about now? It just says you've started screen sharing again, but we're uh -huh. not really seeing, or so, I'm not seeing the screen. Brilliant. Superb. Your screen sharing. Okay, I don't know how to do it. Um, I might just, the slides that I've got anyway aren't especially um, helpful for, you know, they don't add anything that I can't just tell you, so I can just skip the slides um, and go right ahead. I'm going to stop the screen share now just in case something goes weird while I'm talking. Cool. So, um, <clears throat> so yeah, as Angela said, I, I work for the trust and safety teams at a company called Automatic, who are behind the platforms Tumblr and WordPress.com. Been doing that for the past seven or eight years. Um, and in my academic life, I've kind of, um, I've got an interest in freedom of expression and freedom of expression online in particular. And I've kind of fallen down this rabbit hole of intellectual property, um, mostly because, um, not because I thought intellectual property in particular was especially interesting, but more because IP seems to often be used to um, stifle freedom of expression more than, um, you know, protecting the copyrighted works or the works of others or works of creators. Um, so today I'm going to talk a wee bit about the DMCA, which is the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. I'm going to kind of rattle through it because there's quite a lot. Um, I usually like to pepper it with hilarious examples, but that'll have to be toned down so I can fit it in in the time. So I apologize in advance. You'll also see that I'm not a great designer by, oh no, you won't see it because you can't see the slides, which is good because my slides are terrible white with a black text. So um, I'm just going to jump in. Um, the DMCA is, as I mentioned, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Uh, it came into effect in 1998 which was back in the time, even before Napster, believe it or not, which is now long since gone. But at the time, um, the tech sector was kind of just coming into its own and people didn't really know what MP3s were on a grand scale. I remember it was about 1999, I think, that somebody told me what an MP3 was, um, which might give away my age, which is probably not a good thing. However, um, at this point, the record industries were starting to, or the record industry in particular, starting to get antsy about the proliferation of music files that were potentially going to be shared on the internet and had found that suing the users was probably not the best way to go about um, preventing people from um, doing that. Suing your customers generally is not the best approach. Uh, but there was these two major competing interests essentially which were the tech sector who were concerned about 
being sued for the actions of their users and there was the uh, creative industries who wanted to control continue to control and monetize the distribution of their um, media and so the dmca came in as kind of a compromise between the two and it was described as serving several masters but as we'll see it really only serve two masters and that was two main industries. Um, it's important that we talk about the DMCA not just because um, it's an American law uh, which means it uh, guides and regulates many of the internet platforms that impact across the world um, even though it doesn't directly impact European businesses or non-US businesses but it's also the statute that established the notice and takedown mechanism, um, or at least popular, popularized it in subsequent legislation. So we do see similar um, regimes in like uh, the Defamation Act, or at least the regulations around the Defamation Act um, since then. So it's kind of become a model for content regulation on the internet. And that's why it's important and interesting to understand the weaknesses of it and some of the problems the abuse etc has largely been unchanged since it came in in 1998 it had lots of problems in 1998 and it's got even more problems now over time uh, because of that over the past five years it's been in review by the u.s copyright office who have been authoring a report which came out this year and it seems likely there's going to be further um, changes to the dmc over the next few years, some which may be good, some which may be bad, and so that's what I'm going to try and <clears throat> go into a wee bit. Uh, the DMCA itself contains lots of different sections. I'm not going to talk about all of them. I'm only going to focus on section 512, which contains the notice and takedown provisions. Um, there are other parts, such as subpoena powers and stuff, which are uh, equally problematic, but less relevant to um, immediate online intermediary stuff. The, and by that I mean the notice and takedown part is really the most, the one that gets the most attention. Uh, it's the one that's most frequently used and um, most controversial in some ways. So I'm going to look at that. Um, so I'm going to set out what the DMC is, the kind of basics of the notice and takedown system, talk about some of the problems with it, and then look at the USCO report. Um, so the first part, and I have to keep remembering, you can't see these slides, but the first part of this uh, is called the safe harbor and it's under section 512c1 and essentially the safe harbor sets out a general immunity from liability for online service providers, which is quite a, um, a mouthful, but essentially what this means is that a service provider won't be held liable for the actions of their users in relation to copyright so long as they follow the statutory process for content removal. Um, this kind of goes hand in hand in the US with Section 230, also known as uh, Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, which uh, restricts the liability online service providers have for content such as allegedly, uh, allegedly defamatory content, but not IP. So the DMCA uh, touches copyright only. And those two are the main intermediary liability statutes that uh, make up the US regime. Um, Section 512C3 is what's known as the takedown notice section. And essentially what this is, it prescribes the kind of notice that a copyright holder must send to a platform if they wish to have content removed. So say you are a major record label and you come across uh, an, un an unauthorized use of your um, one of your artist songs and um, what you would have to do first is send a section 512c3 notice and um, these notices are uh, they have a specific form they you have to have a signature an identification of the copyrighted work and a statement about um, that the notice is accurate under penalty of perjury, et cetera. There's a whole bunch of different things. I believe there's uh, six, six different parts. And this is in contrast to kind of the GDPR method of um, notification where 
you know, you don't have to say the magic words, Article 17 GDPR, take down request. Uh, just the act of saying that something is unauthorized can be classed as a takedown, a valid takedown, but that's not the case in the DMCA. There is a specific form that the notices have to take, and that's important for what we'll come on to after. Um, the process basically works where if a service provider receives a takedown notice or a valid takedown notice, they then have to disable access to the content in question expeditiously. And that isn't defined in the statute, but it's generally accepted to be around 48 hours. Um, so a 48 hour period between the receipt and the, the removal. Um, some providers are really strict on the statutory requirements of the notices. Um, you know, they'll, there's all sorts of weird things in the statute, like it specifies the signature of a person. So, you know, some creative complainants will uh, try and sign a company name and things like this. And some companies are very strict on that. They'll have a manual review of every takedown notice. Um, other companies will just do an automated removal. So they receive a takedown notice. They don't review it by a human being or there's a very light touch review and they just automatically take the content down. And while the latter is kind of a, it's kind of increasingly frowned upon um, as good practice or best practice, it is still a valid approach under the statute. Um, that's all the statute requires is the intermediary receives a notice of copyright infringement and immediately takes the stuff down. They don't need to do any investigation into you know, whether there is a valid claim or not. And that's one of the issues that will come on you. Um, if a user wishes to appeal a removal, so you're running a website, you upload a cover of, I don't know, um, some Cardi B song that you've made in your house and the record label sends a takedown notice, the service provider takes down the content and you're like, well, you know, this isn't, I created this, this is a cover version that I'm allowed to use this, whatever justification you think you might have. The process is that you have to submit what's called a counter notice and that is under um, section, I can't remember now, section 512G3, I believe. Although I might have that wrong because I haven't written it down. Um, finally, the final part of this kind of jigsaw puzzle is that there's a repeat infringer policy required. So um, you can't go on forever receiving DMC takedown notices on your blog or your site or whatever. If you get a certain number, then your account has to be suspended. And that repeat infringer policy isn't um, stipulated in detail by the DMCA. It's up to the service providers to implement one that makes sense for their platform. Um, most of them, or a lot of them, will do a strike system. So kind of a three strikes and you're out scenario. But the, the way they assess the strikes will be different. So you know, it may be like a strike a year. So you could get a strike and then if after a year you haven't had a strike, another strike, then the strike will uh, reverse. And that is as complicated in practice as it sounds there, the way I've explained it. Um, most service providers will not provide details publicly on their repeat infringer policies because the argument is that if a service provider details the repeat infringer policy that complainants will start to essentially game the system. So if they know that uh, a strike is only assessed every week, for example, or every two days, then they'll start to send notices um, every week strategically to have accounts suspended rather than just to have content removed. And that, that can be a problem. And we've seen this happen in the past. Um, so there's, the DMC has lots of good things. Uh, it kind of produces consistent results. Um, it's seen as being accepted by the industry because it's been around for so long without much change. Um, there is certain kind of certainty with it, but there's also huge problems with the DMCA. Um, first of all, the process is often abused for non-copyright issues. Uh, and so by that, I mean, the DMCA is only uh, is limited to copyright disputes, but if you have a mechanism where you can have content removed from a website very quickly, then 
or relatively very quickly without having to go through a court or go through a kind of nebulous um, non-statutory process for defamation, then people are going to default to the, the path of least resistance. And so you often see reputation management companies, not so much anymore, but you used to see them essentially guaranteeing that they would be able to remove any kind of disputed content about you off the internet and they would often abuse the DMCA. They would submit DMCA takedown notices for content that was either allegedly defamatory um, that was uh, actually trademark infringement, which isn't covered by the DMCA also, etc. So there's figures in various transparency reports from uh, different companies showing that up to about 45% or more of the takedown notices that are received in certain periods are abusive in the sense that they don't cover um, copyright, they cover something else. And that's partly the DMCA's fault uh, in the sense that the DMCA is basically designed as like a complicated game of tennis. So it, it incentivizes a lack of scrutiny on the behalf of the platforms so if a platform receives a notice and they decide that actually the notice is a bogus notice for whatever reason, whether it's um, you know, targeting alleged defamation or anything, the only way the platform can push back is if they lose their safe harbor. So if they reject a DMCA takedown notice that is otherwise valid, then they open themselves up to potential liability. And even in situations where it's really obvious that DMCA takedown is bogus, Companies dealing at scale, you know, thousands of notices um, a month or millions, depending on the size of the platform. They don't want to take on the liability for every notice that might be filed, you know, inappropriately. And so users essentially have to rely on the, the goodwill of platforms and PR pressure on them to protect their freedom of expression. And that is a baked in a consequence of the DMC, which is... Um, less than ideal. There's other big specific procedural problems. Uh, I'll just highlight a few of them. Um, the counter notice in particular, the process is often criticized for being extremely unbalanced. So on one hand, if you want to get content taken down off the internet, it's very easy. You send a takedown notice. Most platforms don't even look at them. They just take the content down. Uh, it's a very strong unilateral power, uh, but you can also submit these notices through a third party agent. You don't have to provide your contact name or anything like that. You, well, sorry, you have to provide contact information, but that can just be limited to an email address. So you don't have to provide an address or you know any real details, personal details to get the content removed. But on the other hand, if you appeal it, appeal the decision as a user, then you have to submit full personal details, including name and address. And the rationale behind that is so that the complainant is able to then take legal action against you if they choose to do so. However, that's obviously quite a large imbalance. And in practice, we've seen a whole number of cases where abusive DMCA takedown notices have been submitted to platforms on behalf of organizations or groups which want to unmask anonymous critics. Um, certain quasi-religious groups that will remain nameless, um, litigious religious groups have been known to do this, uh, to find out the names and addresses of um, prominent critics, anonymous prominent critics. And we've seen far-right groups in places like Germany who have submitted false DMCA take their notices against you know, content that they don't own the copyright to so that the counter notice comes in and they get the details of these people that have been working against them. So that, is, that isn't a you know, theoretical problem, it's a, a real uh, concern. A um, couple of, uh, yeah, in, in practice, all of this stuff, you know, the, the process is quite complicated. If you, re if you receive a takedown notice, it's quite intimidating. You have to give up a lot of personal information and in practice, that means a really small number of counter notices are actually filed. I think the automatic figures are each reporting period, we have like less than 1% of takedown notices are subject to a counter notice. Um, and we don't see that as, you know, just that all of these notices are legitimate. It is 
largely attributable to the nature of the process and the complexity rather than the actual veracity of the complaints. Um, in fact, we had, we had a complaint last week, I believe, where someone was um, uh, critical of the fact that they felt they had to seek out legal advice uh, in order to submit a counter notice, when in actual fact the counter notice is fairly straightforward, um, at least in relative legal terms, and you don't need a lawyer to do it. But that's the kind of um, problem in the perception of users. They see this legal process and feel like it's more complicated than it is. Um, finally, on the kind of criticisms portion, before we move on a wee bit, the, there's no real penalties for submitting fake notices. So under Section 512F, there are um, there is the possibility of damages if somebody submits a notice which materially misrepresents their copyrights. However, in practice, the threshold um, for meeting, you know, to meet the threshold is extremely difficult. There's been very few Section 512F cases that have been successful. Um, and in practice, there's no real deterrent to sending fake notices. Um, one of the uh, criticisms from the rights holders is that the DMC essentially leaves the onus on them to track down all instances of infringement on the internet. And they say this is a huge task that platforms should be doing more to try and suppress material that they quote unquote know is infringing. And because of that, there's been this proliferation of automated notices where bots are set up by rights holders to scan the internet and fire off DMC takedowns for any mention of their product or service. And the problem with this is that we then have millions of notices that are sent by robots that are signed under penalty of perjury, which are just operating in a script to find any mention of a certain product. And there's like innumerable examples of this going wrong, as you might expect, where authors have taken down their own book off their own website because they've hired a firm that have sent out automated take down notices who have then targeted the author's own book. Um, this has happened multiple times in various industries, so it's also not a theoretical thing. Um, a quick note on fair use, uh, because Many people that aren't in, you know, intimately familiar with copyright often assume that copyright is straightforward. You either have the right to use something or you don't. And fair use or uh, fair dealing, depending on your jurisdiction, it's kind of a big uh, stick in the spoke. And essentially, this means that there are, there's a, a you're able to use uh, content that you don't have the permission to use in certain circumstances, for example, for parody, for news reporting, commentary, education. Um, and so it's not always clear cut. And this is kind of the big thing that makes all of copyright um, discussions much harder because you can't just, you know, implement a filter like the European Union have been, well, the European uh, uh, sorry, the e-commerce, not the e-commerce directive, the copyright directive has been suggesting with Article 17. Um, so that kind of sticks a spoke, uh, stick, sticks a stick in the spoke. Um, the test for fair use as well in the US isn't statutory, uh, isn't defined in a statutory way. It's a kind of a, a four-stage test and it depends on the facts. And so there aren't any clear uh, black and white ways to determine fair use, which um, compounds the problem. There's a whole bunch of examples of DMCA takedown notices that have involved fair use uh, kind of complications. And one of the famous ones was, is known as the dancing baby case. And this is the one part I wish I was able to show you my slide because there's a very nice photo of a, a grinning child. But as the facts of this case, uh, as the name of this case may suggest, um, someone called Stephanie Lenz uploaded a video of her child uh, who would dance to Prince's Let's Go Crazy whenever it came on the radio. And 
it was a really bad quality video. It wasn't wasn't HD or anything like that. The audio was really poor. But Universal Records sent a take down notice and had it removed. Her account got struck, all the rest of it. And the Electronic Frontier Foundation represented Stephanie Lenz and took it to court. And they won one of the few Section 512F misrepresentation cases, which then established a standard that said that complainants have to consider fair use before they submit a DMCA takedown notification. Now, in practice, whether that makes any difference or not is another question, but that's important because the US Copyright Office have specifically spoken about that Lens case uh, in their report. So to sum up, that was like a, a whirlwind journey through the DMCA notes and takedown process, but essentially provides semi-consistent results, but it's a quote-unquote a system that makes nobody happy. It benefits kind of the major industries that are involved and uh, ripe for abuse, provides intermediaries with this incentive to not get involved, even though users then rely on the platforms to um, uphold their freedom of expression rights. And fair use kind of gets lost in amongst all this. So the USCO, US Copyright Office, um, as I mentioned, has been working on um, recommendations for reviewing the DMCA, um, updating it, and they are going to put their findings, I believe, to Congress. The process is still ongoing, but they released a report earlier this year, just a few months ago. And um, this, there's some good things about the report, which I'll talk about, and then there's some like worrying things. And they're worrying not just for the DMCA, but also because a lot of the discussion that's going on around this is also kind of in the context of the wider um, questions about intermediary liability, what role platforms have to play, copyright directive and you know the EU that is getting brought up in almost every discussion on the DMCA at the moment. Um, so that it's important that we know what the kind of trends are in the regulatory world around this because it's going to have a knock-on effect, whatever happens. Um, the positives of the report are that they recognise that platforms are different sizes. Smaller platforms don't have the massive resources of Google to comply with the requirements of the DMCA. Uh, it's quite possible that, and we've seen this happen in practice, that automated takedown notices in particular can overwhelm smaller platforms to the extent that they either have to just process every notice, which is not the best case uh, scenario, or um, they just cripple them so they're unable to comply with the requirements. You know, you could be a tiny uh, company of, you know, a few people that have started you know, an app or something, but if you have user-generated content, you could then find that you've got thousands and thousands of takedown notices to deal with, and you have no way to practically deal with that. So it's good that the report recognized this, uh, they did also recognize the problem of automated notices and the inability of the note of the algorithms to determine fair use based on its contextual nature and that's really important because that point was lost or was kind of dismissed in a lot of the discussions around the copyright directive and so thank god the USDO at least recognized that fair use is contextual and cannot be um detected adequately by the algorithm. And in terms of the counter notice, they recognized that the period of time involved in the counter notice was inadequate. And what that refers to is, if you um, send a DMC take down notice, the content comes down almost immediately, basically within 20, 40 hours ish, so expeditiously. But if you send a counter notice to have your material uh, reinstated, there's a 10 to 14 day period where it doesn't get reinstated. The reason being for that is that it's to allow the complainant time to give evidence or show evidence that they've filed legal action relating to the content. And if they do that, then the content doesn't come back up. But if they don't do it, then the content comes back up after the 10 to 14 day period. And um, the problem with that is, as the USCO noted, that 10 to 14 days is not a lot of time to prepare and file legal process but it also means that content 
which someone has sworn under the penalty of perjury that they have the right to use, stays offline for 10 to 14 days. And so you essentially have, um, you can have a situation where someone sends a bogus notice, the content stays down for two weeks. And if you look at, or more actually, if you look at the practical um, reality of things, and on the internet, as we know, the day, especially in relation to current events, when you upload things, the first day or two is like the peak of traffic, uh, the peak of ad revenue and everything else. And so if you have content you upload and it gets taken down almost immediately, and then you have to wait two weeks, then that content's basically useless, especially when it comes to news reporting and so on. Um, finally, the urged caution, the USCO urged caution on this idea of notice and stay down, which is something I referred to a wee bit earlier, where rights holders essentially have been arguing for some time that if they tell a platform that certain material is unauthorized, that that material shouldn't be able to just go back online again. And this again is similar to the copyright directive um, approach. But of course, in practice, that the problem with that is that just because one instance of unauthorized material is present that doesn't mean that all instances are unauthorized especially when you look at fair use so those are the kind of good things they um they <laughs> picked up on and um, there were some more concerning things that we should probably be concerned about uh, as wider intermediary liability people and um, the first was the report suggested that in relation to the repeat infringer policies, so the policies which dictate when a user will be suspended, uh, they said that because there's no statutory definition of these repeat infringer policies, that they should be more transparent, they should be published by the platforms somewhere potentially. And the problem with this is evident based on what we said earlier, by doing this, it becomes a game of strategic timing with takedown notices rather than having content removed. Uh, notices are spaced out in a specific way to get users suspended quicker. And while that may not seem like a huge problem, you know, the user account's been suspended because they're, uh, you know, they're breaching copyright essentially. It does mean that you can have a user who's suspended almost immediately for content that's legacy content from years ago and they haven't had any chance to go back through their site and be like, oh, I didn't realize that this wasn't you know, authorized or whatever and clean up their act before their whole account gets suspended. And this is important because when someone's account is suspended under the repeat infringer policy, there is no um, appeal to that. It's a statutory thing. You, don't, you aren't able to appeal the suspension on that basis. It's, it, even if the platform wanted to, they aren't allowed to allow you back. And that's a bigger problem when it comes to the question of ISPs and uh, internet connection. So, okay, maybe your Twitter account gets suspended and that's a problem, but it's not as big a problem as cutting someone's internet access off, which is a possibility. Um, the final two things. Uh, they also, rights holders, have been complaining for some time that platforms now are directing people or complainants to web-based forms for their uh, take down notice submissions. So instead of sending an email, they're encouraging people to use forms that have specific fields in them. And the reason the platforms do this generally is to, if you're processing thousands of notices a day and trying to do a best um, practice manual review of them, if you have five, well, let's say even 500 complainants a day, it's quite possible that you'll have 500 different formats of notices. The language is often not the way it is in the statute. Trying to find all the elements, it makes the whole process much harder to deal with, um, especially at scale. And so the platforms have tried to combat this and combat abuse of the system by creating web-based forms. People can still submit DMCA takedowns by email. They're required to be able to do that under the statute, but it's just an easier way of doing things. Rights holders don't like this for a, a number of reasons. One, it means they generally can't use their automated bots on the form because captures, et cetera, and two, because the forms often require more information than the statute 
requires. So, for example, even though you're only required by the statute to provide an email address at minimum, well, some contact information, which could be an email address uh, for your takedown notice, a lot of the forms will require your name and address, and that's an attempt to balance out the imbalance of the process. However, USCO has noted that there are issues there uh, about platforms going above and beyond the requirements. And so there's talk about um, standardizing forms or perhaps limiting the use of these forms or making the email address that people can send DMCA take their notices to much more prominent on websites, etc. And that's something that'll be interesting to watch and see what happens. Um, finally, there's this question about Lens and the Dancing Baby case and whether or not the outcome of that case went further than Congress would have intended with fair use. Um, there's a, an amazing quote in the report from the Authors Guild, I think, which um, I'm hesitant to call out specifically, but they said that in practice, and I'm going to paraphrase here, so don't you know come after me, but they said that in practice, abusive or uh, false notices were extremely rare. And that to me is mind boggling because if you look at the reports of any, transparency reports of any platform, the amount of abusive notices is significant. It's a significant portion. And so there's, there's some danger in this notion that um, the USCO is recommending that Congress look again at the one case that's been won under, well, the one main case that's been won under Section 512F. Um, and that's kind of one of the biggest concerns with this report is if you look at the report, it tends to take a very oversimplified view of the DMCA. Platforms think the DMCA is good, rights holders think it's bad, and it essentially just reopens this can of worms that it had in 1998. A lot of the nuance is lost, a lot of the procedural problems are lost in the report. There isn't really a focus on the imbalance of the DMCA with the counter notice, apart from the couple of bits that I mentioned. And it does seem as if the report is going back and suggesting that a lot of areas are problems which users and platforms have fought hard in the courts over the past 20 years to win. And there could be a reset, which would not be a great thing. Um, if the natural progress has been um, to give certain limited protections to platforms and users, then it seems like a mistake to go back and reverse that. And whilst the USCO has specifically said that they're not looking to make sweeping changes to the DMCA, they just want to fine tune things. It does seem like they're fine tuning things in areas which um, benefit rights holders over um, users and their expression. And I think the, the kind of final summation of this stuff is that reading the report, um, it does feel very much like uh, being caught between these two major industries and their advocacy groups and their public policy teams. There's no real deep consideration or really any real consideration at all of users expression or the impact on users it's just a, to quote um, someone else, uh, users are just a footnote in the USCO's report, which when we're talking about the common medium of expression for so many people now, there should be much more consideration on the impact of users and all of this. And uh, that that is it. I did have a nice slide at the end, but you can't see it. <laughs>